Well, good afternoon. You know, it's really great that you all came out on this nice sunny day. And it's sunny somewhere. Actually, the weather said it was supposed to be um, after it stopped snowing at noon, and there would be sun. I'm going to call Chuck Gitaka and say, really, you guys really screwed up on this one. So if you notice, I'm, I'm walking with a limp. I have a, I, I have a torn ACL. Yeah, yeah, yes. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> so uh, at, at the, the school, when I walked in uh, after tearing it, uh, the students, one student, she said, Dr. McKinnon, she said, well, you're walking with a se severe limp. What, uh, what happened? I said, well, I tore my ACL. So I said, let me tell you the story of how I did it. And by that time, other students had come around the, this young lady. I said, you, you, if you remember last year when uh, uh, Cleveland was playing uh, uh, Golden State, and she, they said, yeah. I said, well, LeBron James, uh, he was so upset when they lost the championship game that the next day I'm in my office at the university and the phone rings, it's LeBron James. And they're going, oh, wow, wow. I said, yeah. He said, uh, Dr. McKinnon, I understand that you do um, – a lot of motivating of people. I said, well, yes, I do. He said, well, listen, I know people say I'm the best uh, basketball player in the world, but I want to absolutely uh, reach another level. So if you can help me to do that, I said, well, I'll tell you what, you come to the university the next couple of days and I'll work with you over at Callahan Hall. So you just imagine now, LeBron James, Callahan Hall, and Ike McKinnon. And, uh, he said at some point, let's play a one-on-one -on -one game. <laughs> and so I'm in the gym, and the kids, I mean, they're just like you were, but even more. And so I said, um, we're playing this one-on-one -on -one game, and LeBron goes up to take a shot. I went up to block the shot. I came down and tore my knee. <laughs> and I said to them, as I'm saying to you today, I was lying. I didn't play ball with LeBron James. <laughs> I mean, but think about this. A 75-year-old man thinking that he played ball with LeBron James and the students believed it. <laughs> it is good to be here today. And if we talk about faith in a violent society, uh, there, I'm going to talk to you today about a number of things that I've seen, I've been a part of. For instance, I was shot at eight times so I was in the police department. They missed all eight times, thank God. Uh, I um, was stabbed twice. They did miss, but I'm still alive to be here. And people say, Ike, you know, you have a great sense of humor. You're smiling uh, when you're talking now. I said, well, they missed all eight times. I'm alive after being stabbed twice. So I thank God for this. But as we talk about, as, this is violence. is something not specific to my life as a law enforcement officer, but it paralleled my growth from joining the Air Force and going to Vietnam, from all the years I spent in law enforcement of the Detroit Police Department. Now, let me say to you this. The person most responsible for shaping my life and the things that I've done and getting me to understand life was my father. His name was Cody McKinnon, a deeply religious man who was born in Alabama in 1900. My father, he said he had a second grade education. And of course, this stood out for me as this young child. But let me tell you, I remember I was about eight or nine years of age. My, my father would go and get the Bible. And he would bring the Bible and he'd say, son, listen, you know, I had a second grade education. I want you to read this for me. And so one or two times a week, my dad and I would sit down and I would read certain things from the Bible. And even more so, my father would say, okay, now, let's talk about that and what this means. And of course, I mean, I absolutely hated this, to tell you the truth, because here I am, this eight or nine-year-old kid, and I'm reading from the Bible, and things I didn't understand, but my father, he wanted me to do this. And, and after a while, as I grew older, my father said, well, the reason I'm doing this is because, number one, I want you to uh, become a better reader, but number two, I want you to understand the Bible. And that has set a foundation for my life. You know, 
it's, it's something that one thinks about, but when you think about all the things that happened in your life, what affected it most? I remember when I was in Vietnam, uh, Father Shea, he got a group of us together and we went over to an orphanage. And we held the children. You think about this now. There are about eight of us guys, all Air, Air Force people, and we're at this orphanage in Da Nang, and we would hold babies for a couple hours. Now, you wonder what this meant to the children, but I know what it meant to me and to the other airmen that were there. It, it touched our lives, and I can still see the faces of some of those young babies that, that I was holding. And, I, and I, I always said this, and people who know me, they will tell you that I always said things like, God, why me? Why me? And so as soldiers in a war, we're holding babies. And so I always thought about this in terms of why? And so when I came and joined the police department in 1965, I was on patrol one day and we got a call on a suicide, or attempted suicide. I, with my partner, responded and there's this young lady who had this disease in which she could not go outside. I mean, the light was such that it would cause severe problems with her skin. And so she's looking at me and I'm looking at her. I think she was 13 years of age. And she said to me, she said, I don't want to live. Uh, she said, my, um, my mother says that I sh should not do this, but I can't, I can't. She says, I can never get married. I can never have children. There are things that I can't do. I can never travel and see the world. This is a 13-year-old girl who's loosening up to me and telling me about her life. Now, here I am, this guy who's been in Vietnam, and I'm looking at this young lady, and I said, you know, there are people who really care about you and love you. And she said, there's nobody who cares except for my mother. I said, well, the short time that I've been here talking to you, I care about you. I said, if you will promise me that you don't, won't do anything I said, I will come and visit you every day if possible, and if not, as often as possible. She said, you will? I said, of course I will. And so, for the next six months, I visited her every day. And her life and attitude changed about this. And I go back to, God, you know, look, <laughs> I mean, there are other officers who could have gotten this call, but I got it. And I saved this young girl's life and how much it meant not only to her, but to me, and to her, her parents. And I maintained contact with her for a number of years. And the, the other thing, in 1965, 1966, we were driving down the street and we see this house that's on fire. And there's a young girl who's standing out front. She's probably four or five years old. And I, we rushed to the house that was on fire. And I said, is there anyone else in the house? She says, my mommy and my sisters and brother. Well, when these things happen, you act. And so I ran into the house and pulled another young girl out and pulled the, the mother out uh, of the window. Unfortunately, two young kids passed away. But again, you ask, why me? Well, it was a number of years later I was still on the police department, and I received this call. I said, are you Lieutenant McKinnon? I said, yes, I am. She said, you won't remember me, but a number of years ago, you saved my life. And I said, oh, you, Belinda. She says, yes. She said, how do you remember my name? I said, you can't forget something like this. She said, I want you to know that I'm calling you for two reasons. Number one, I never said thank you because I was so young, but number two, I'm getting married next week and I'd like you to walk me down the aisle. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, and I did. <laughs> I did, and it was such a great time. And you, know, and you start, ask, again, I ask why, and there's a, there's a reason here. If you can go out and do these things, not just save a life as the priests or ministers do, but to do as much as you can to have an impact on their lives. And so, I ran across this young man who was walking down the middle, the middle of Jefferson. And uh, I said, you know, you shouldn't be doing this. And he swore at me. I said, well, you come on now. I, this is the way that I am with people. I said, no, you shouldn't do that. He no, no, he swore at me. I said, okay, we're gonna talk. So I 
said, you're going to sit in the car. And as, he, as the procedure is with, a, with a, a police car, you used to search everyone before they get into your car. I patted him down, and he had $25,000 in cash on him. I said, young man, where'd you get this from? He said, I invested wisely. <laughs> I said, I want to know who your investment counselor is, you know. So as I'm talking to him, I said, how old are you? He says, 15. I said, I know what you're doing. You're selling drugs, and you have $25,000 in cash on you. I said, what kind of life are you going to live? If you continue to do this, you won't be, live to be 16. And what he said to me was prophetic, but also scary. He said, if I don't live to be 16, I had 15 good years. Now, you think about that. Here's this young man that I'm coming across who's dealing drugs, and he's happy with 15, or doesn't expect to be more than 15 years of age. He didn't. He didn't, didn't live to be 16. He was killed a few months later. But this life that one lives and the life that one sees as you interact with people, and you say, God, please, look, there's, there's too much here. And so I went back to work, and we went to this house on a shooting in southwest Detroit. And I walked into the door with um, one of the detectives, and there was this lady lying on the floor. She had been shot in the head. Beautiful young lady. And uh, I looked into the, other, the next room, and there were two young kids, seven and eight, who also had been shot. And I said, God, come on, Lord, please, please. And at that time, I heard a scream in the back room, and it was one of the detectives who said, sir, you got to see this. And there was a three-month-old child who'd been shot in the head. You know, and, and so, again, it was something that stuck with me and still to this day. And, Lord, why me? Why me? I started getting these horrible migraines horrible migraines, because it was something that was there, and you hope that you can have some impact on people's lives like the little girl, but certainly not for you, people to lose a life. It was a scary time. It was a scary time. But as things would happen, I was in my office one day as a chief of police, and uh, this young police officer walks into my office, and he said, Chief, uh, I hope you can do me a favor. I said, what's that? He said, I was in Windsor yesterday, and I was at Devonshire Mall, and I came across this young man who looked as if he'd lost his last friend. And I'm interesting in listening. He said, he talked to the young boy and said, why are you so sad? And the boy said, I'm dying. He said, I have cancer, and I'm dying. I won't live for another six months. And he said, Chief, I know that you have an affinity for helping people, would you just talk to this young man? I said, of course I will. I said, give me his number. So I called the fa family, and his name is Danny Steinke, S-T-E-I-N-K-E. Anyway, I called the family. I told them who I was, and they were so thrilled that here's this guy calling. I said, listen, could you bring Danny to my office? And they did that next day. And Danny came to me. He was this little boy who... Um, Every day, I'm sorry, every day he went through chemo uh, for about a month or so. He was so weak. But as he got to my office, he said, oh, he said, oh, I want to be a police officer. I said, Danny, this, this is great. He said, but I don't know if I can. He says, I'm dying. I said, Danny, that might not be the case. So I made Danny chief for the day. And the first thing I asked him for was a pay raise. <laughs> and Mayor Archer, I, we called Mayor Archer, and Danny said to Mayor Archer, give the chief a pay raise. And, and Dennis said, no way. <laughs> but so, chief for the day, we took him uh, on the, uh, the boat, the helicopter, all these wonderful things. And Danny, his mom said, you know, chief, uh, this is making Danny feel so good. And so Darren McCurdy, who's a friend of mine, and Chris Osgood at the Red Wings at this time, where they had a good team, and so I called them. <laughs> hey, I've lived through all, all the 50s and all those great teams, you know. Anyway, so 
we, we took Danny over to uh, the Joe. And um, Darren McCurdy and Chris Osgood, they did such a great job of taking Danny on the ice and skating with him. And I'm, I'm there in tears because here's this young boy who says he's dying and he's skating on the ice. And in fact, Chris Osgood let him score a goal. And uh, it was just so wonderful for this. And so for the next uh, six months or so, every time there was a game, we would get the mayor's suite and we would go take Danny to this game. So Danny's mom said, you know, Danny's really feeling so much better. He's, he has, he's got strength. He's feeling so good, good about this. Danny kept living. And so when Danny was 20 years old, I was doing a speech up at Mackinac Island, the Grand Hotel. And I'm talking to them, and excuse me. And I said, you should know about this young man who's this real good friend of mine and what he's going through in life. There's about 1,000 young people there. I think they're ages 10 to 17. And they're listening. And I told them Danny's story. In the midst of the story, I'm, I start crying. And of course, the kids, some are crying, and some are wondering why this big chief of police is crying about this story. And so I knew something was wrong. And so I went back and made a call to Danny over family over in Windsor. And his mom said, you know, Danny, he's 20 and he's dying. He might not make it to tomorrow. So I came back and went to the hospital, and Danny was still there. Now, Danny had been in a coma. And so I walked in, and his mom said, oh, Danny, uh, Chief McKinnon's here. And Danny opened his eyes. And he did like this. He pointed. He pointed at me. I went, oh, God, you know. And uh, he said, thank you. you know? And so Danny passed away. And I had the privilege of delivering the eulogy at Danny's funeral. We buried Danny in a police uniform. And we got the Windsor police to have their um, honor guard treat him as if it was a regular police officer. That's why, God. <laughs> That's why. Because of all the bad things that I've seen, there's so many thing, great things and people whose lives that I've had the pleasure of interacting with in some form or fashion. Think about it. The things that you do, the things that we do, and the impact on someone's life. And so, in 1991, I had the pleasure of meeting Nelson Mandela. He was here in Detroit after he had been released from Robbins Island. And so, I said, Mr. Mandela, now I want you to imagine Nelson Mandela and Ike McKinnon there, you know? And Nelson Mandela's uh, accent. And so I said, Mr. Mandela, please, can I talk with you? Because I always do this. I go up to anyone. I did it to Halle Berry. It didn't work, but, uh, you know. <laughs> I have a picture with Halle Berry in my office. And it's her punching. No, no. <laughs> anyway. I said, Mr. Mandela, tell me, aren't you angry at the people in South Africa for imprisoning you for 27 years? for your beliefs and because of the color of your skin. And Nelson Mandela looked at me. Now imagine that she said, young man, tell me about yourself. I said, Mr. Mandela, I'm just this guy from Detroit. Tell me about yourself, he said. I said, Mr. Mandela, please. Young man, I want to know about your life. So I told him the preliminary stuff. He said, why did you want to become a police officer? I said, well, Mr. Mandela, it's a long story. I'm here. <laughs> I said, when I was 14 years old in Detroit, leaving high school, there were four officers that was called the Big Four at that time. They grabbed me and they beat me up. He goes, uh-huh. And I said, that evening, I didn't tell anyone, but I made a decision I wanted to become a police officer. 
He says, uh-huh. I said, because I wanted to make sure that those kinds of things didn't happen, not only to me, but also to anyone else, regardless of color, regardless of gender. That was important to me, because it was wrong when it happened to me. He said, young man, that is a great story. He said, you must continue to tell that story to have an impact upon the lives of other young people. I listen to Nelson Mandela who's telling me that this is right. He said, just think of all the people whose lives you can impact by telling them. You could have become an angry young man. You could have had all the hatred for police officers that we see today. He said, but no, you chose the other side. I want you to, he said, continue to tell that story and make sure that you tell it everywhere that you go. I said, wow, this is Nelson Mandela talking to me. And I said, that's why. It's the Dannys, it's the Nelson Mandela, it's the impact one can have on someone's life. And so it was six months after that that Bishop Desmond Tutu came to Detroit. Uh, we, we have a great picture together. <laughs> There's Dr. Uh, Bishop Tutu is probably about that tall. And so there I am with him. My, and so I, I said to my son, my oldest son, Jeffrey, I said, do you want to have breakfast with Bishop Tutu? He said, yeah. I think he was in the UD High at the time. And we had breakfast with Bishop <laughs> Tutu. And so I said to him, Bishop Tutu, tell me about yourself in South Africa. Nope. Tell me about yourself. I said, oh, God. <laughs> this is really true. I said, here I am, this guy from Detroit who lived at Brewster Projects and all those things. And now I'm talking to Desmond Tutu, who wants to know about my life. So I told him the same thing that I did <laughs> with Nelson Mandela. And he said, continue to tell that story. <laughs> continue to tell it. And that's what I do. That's what I do. And you know, it's important to have a message, and the message is not to have hatred. I could have been, as Nelson Mandela said, I could have been this angry young man. I could have been extremely angry because I was beaten up. And the name calling that these police officers did to me, and I said, no, not every police officer is that way. No. But if I can go out and tell young people that, or whomever it might be, that the impact it had on my life touched Nelson Mandela and Bishop Tutu and others. That was so important to me. And so, a few years ago, I was at a function and Martin Luther King III was there. And we talked and I told him my story. He said, boy, my dad would have loved hearing that. I said, well, thank you. And then he told the story. He said, his dad, in 1965 or 1966, had a very good friend who was an extremely wealthy man. And the man, he came to Dr. King. He says, Martin, he said, I have loads of money. And I want to take that money and use it to change the world. And Dr. King said, that's a wonderful thought. He said, so this man sought out, or set out to change the world. About a year later, he ran into Dr. King. And he said, Dr. King said to him, so how's it going? Boy, he said, there's too many problems in the world. I can't change all those problems. He said, maybe I should set my sight on the United States. And Dr. King said to him, well, I hope so. And as it would go, uh, Martin Luther King III said, his dad received a call from this man a few months later. He said, Martin, uh, there's just too many problems in the world and I can't change the world. He said, what should I do? And he said, Dr. King told him, maybe you should change yourself. And I say that to you because there's so many things that we do or maybe we don't listen to. But I changed myself by listening to what my father said, by reading that Bible. I didn't know I was going to become a police officer who was shot at eight times, stabbed twice in a plane crash in Vietnam and all those other things. I didn't know that. But my father prepared me for that. Listen, son. Read this. 
This can have a tremendous impact on your life. And so that's what I try and do as much as possible. I retired from the university December 21st last year. And Channel 4 ran this big story on it uh, that uh, Ike McKinnon's retiring. And this is his fourth retirement. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I can't get away from it because there's so many things that I want to do. Two young men here from uh, Loyola High School, who I just met today, who I'm going to have more to say with as time goes on. I gave them my cell number so that we could have contact and have an impact on their lives and other people's lives. As we know, there are too many problems that are existing in this city in which men are not taking responsibility for. And when I retired, I told them, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do everything I can to mentor young men to help change and impact their lives. And that's my next goal in life. Thank you so much for inviting me here today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ike. Thank you. Um, we're going to have about 10 minutes or so for questions and answers. Mary Alice, where are you, Mary Alice? Is, <laughs> there she is with the microphone. So uh, we'll try and accommodate as many as possible. I'm sure there are a lot of questions for Ike. Um, raise your hand. Mary Alice will come over. Thanks, Ike. Thank you. Thank you. You mean I talked all that time? There's no questions? <laughs> this one. Before I listen, my oldest son Jeff is 40 years old, and he said, Dad, I know what you're trying to do with doing all these good things. You're trying to get into heaven because you're old. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't deny it, no. <laughs> yes, sir. So, Ike, Dan McKinney. Hey, Dan. Uh, how are you, sir? I'm good. How are you? So, just a comment, not a question. So, I'm 51. I met this man at the University of Detroit between 85 and 89 when I played basketball there. I would encourage the two gentlemen that have his cell phone use it, because I've been using it for 30 years, and it works. Thanks, Dan. Guaranteed, Thanks, Dan. it works. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, this. Okay. Hello, Chief. Um, can you just tell us about some of the time, tell us about how you got stabbed. <laughs> <laughs> tell us about how you got shot. <laughs> <laughs> shot at. I told you I could duck very well, you know. As a young officer, I um, responded to a place in Jeffrey's Projects. And, uh, you know, they always tell you to use good caution about this. And this lady was extremely drunk. And so I turned her around to put handcuffs on her, and she swung around and hit me in the neck. I still have the scar here. And, uh, that's how I got stabbed. The, the shooting times um, were, God, it's just a, you, sometimes you don't want really of that. So go back and see the movie uh, De, uh, Detroit. I think they have a depiction of what happened to me there with, um, we were over by Sacred Heart Seminary on patrol. And uh, we heard shooting, and then you could see the bullets skimming along the street. And um, at that time, I was, uh, what, 24? And I dove out of the, the Jeep I was in, and I did cartwheels and went up against the wall as the bullets were skimming along the, the pavement. And that's the only time in my life I've ever done a cartwheel. <laughs> so my granddaughter said, could you do another one, Grandpa? I'm not on your laptop. So the, that, the shootings, you know, as I reflect back on them, I thank God that um, uh, obviously there's a, a message and uh, a way for things for me to do things to help. Wasn't ready for me yet. What do you see as the most hopeful signs for the young people in Detroit today? Uh, there's a couple things. Number, number one, I think that there, there's, there are people who are going towards having a good and positive education for young people, which you know, unfortunately some are reading, and most are reading at a level that's way be, be, be beneath them. I think secondly, we have a great number of people that's trying to help young people. They, they're either uh, 
getting, have, helping them get jobs, or as the governor pointed out last night, about the education. You know, if we can do that and change their minds, see, people say you can't do it. Well, I mean, you know, Judge Mathis you know, on TV, Judge Mathis, I chased Judge Mathis down uh, Jefferson as a young thug. And he's, he still talks about this, you know. Plus, I was fast enough to catch him, so. <laughs> yes. I have two questions. <clears throat> First question is, I've never met you in person, never saw you in person, but you look the same as you did about 25 years ago. You never aged. How do you do that? Well, you, what's that story about the mirror? <laughs> <laughs> you have no gray hair. I have a few, I have a few, okay. but uh, you know. The second question is, uh, like if you wanted to uh, pro provide literacy into the city of Detroit, because if you, you can't read by the age of third grade, yes. fourth grade, you're gonna be left behind. Yes. So if you knocked on some doors that don't open as they say, well, we don't need the help, you know, what would you suggest to get through that door? Well, we, we have to keep trying. It's, it's, it's almost simple what we do because I've gone to schools to speak, and, the, and, I, and I stipulate that parents should be there, and no parents show up. And I, I, I will call them at home and say, listen, I'm at your child's school, and I gave them my time to be here to try to have an impact on their lives. You should be here. And every time, well, no, I, I was busy. No, you're not too busy to help your child. And, and I, I push, I push, because it's so important. Chief, I have a uh, question. Uh, yes. Did either of your sons, Jeffrey or Jason, follow in your footsteps? No, thank God they didn't. <laughs> no, no, they're making loads of money. <laughs> no, Jeff uh, is the oldest. He's, uh, oh, to tell you this. So Jeffrey, he, great, he went to Michigan, and he, he lets me know that because I'm a grad, Michigan State grad. So when Jeffrey graduated from Michigan, we're up there, and, and he walks across the stage, and he comes out, and he says, Dad, this makes us about equal. I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, an undergrad from Michigan, a PhD from Michigan State is about the same. <laughs> See, just like the person who applauded, you know. That, and so I, I said to Jeff, I said, listen, son, I paid for your education. He said, I told you you guys were dumb. So <laughs> that's my son. And those of you who know, you know. <laughs> yes. So I. Yes. I imagine most of us in this room would be phenomenal mentors, but for a, a number of us, we might be thinking, how do I even start? I'm no Ike McKinnon, right? Yeah, yeah. What's a challenge you might provide or a step that you might provide us to get started? Okay, thank mentor? you, that's, that's, that's very good. Uh, number one, since I've, I've been around for a long time and know a great number of people, I've made contact with them, whether it's Urban League or, or New Detroit or any organization or church Listen, let's talk about this, I say to the minister or whomever it might be. Let's talk because you have these young people in your, your, your church, your school, your area, and let me try and help them. And usually at that, at that point, Angela, it, uh, they'll, they'll open their doors. You know, to me. I, I'll, I'll probably be working harder than I did for years right now, but this is so important. And so uh, when I pass on, Jeffrey can say, see, Dad did it, you know. <laughs> That, oh. oh, that's it? Hi there. Yeah, oh. um, in our parish, a few years ago, we started a group called the Beloved Community, yes. basically because we honor Dr. King very seriously every, every January. And the thing that's happened in that group is that white people and black people have told their real stories to one another, and it's hurt both of us. Yeah. Um, you talk like a man who has lived the beloved community. What, how did you come to the capacity to do that? Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Well, in 1957, my grandmother passed away. The family was born in Alabama. So my dad drives me and my brother to um, Montgomery for the funeral. Now, this is 1957, and my father always talked to me about, he said, there's good and bad in every group. So on our way back, it's about one in the morning, and we're outside of Birmingham, Alabama, and this car with these six white 
young men pulled up next to us. And they started throwing bottles and bricks and yelling names and obscenities to us. And I'm scared because this is outside of Birmingham, Alabama in 1957. And my father, he became a general. He said, listen, I'll take care of you. I won't let anything happen to you. I'll take care of you. But he said to me, he said, listen, you take the baseball bat. And my brother, he said, you take the tire iron. And he said, now, if we have to stand back to back, we'll do that. But I want you to know that I'm going to take care of you. And so we're driving, and this, this continues for a while. So we literally came to a fork in the road. And uh, we went off to the right, and they were going so fast, they were going, went left. So shortly down the street, there was a Shell gas station. And we pulled into the Shell gas station, and we got out. And as we got out, the car pulls up again with these six guys with baseball bats, and some had chains and so forth. And they started calling names and said, tell us they were going to kill us. And so at this point, my father said, he's going to listen. Put our backs to each other. We've got to fight this up if we have to. At this point, four white United States soldiers walked out of this gas station. And they said, no, you're not going to do that. And of course, the six guys, they said, you know, what? what? You, you, you're for them? So yeah, you're not going to hurt anyone. You're not going to fight them. If you fight them, we will, I will fight with them. We'll fight with them. And I went, well, this is something. And so these six guys jumped in the car and took off. And at this point, my father says to the guys, he says, thank you all. Thank you all. He said, this has never happened before. And the one guy, he said, we couldn't let that happen. He says, it's important for all of us to live in dignity. So my father shook their hands. I must admit, I didn't. I was a little bit crazy. And as we got back in the car, my father, he said, see, what did I tell you? There's good people and there's bad people in every group. Understand that, son. There's good and there's bad. And you cannot, by first blush, assume that a person is bad. Those four young men, he said, were giving their lives to help us. They didn't know us. He said, there's some people, as the ones who call them names, would say that about them, but they are about helping people. And so as a result of that conversation I had with my dad, it just lifted any kind of anger, hatred that I had. And everyone that I see, I see them as a person. And I hope that everybody else can do that now. OK? Thank you. Yes? The legalization of recreational marijuana, is that going to help things with the youth in Detroit, or is it going to make it worse? It might help my knee. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, listen, I, I think that, honestly, I don't think it's going to bother, because those people that were using it are going to continue to do so. And those young people can't get in and get, it's kind of like alcohol. You know, I'm sure there'll be people that they send in to get something for them. But no, I think it'll, it'll be positive. But, and so <laughs> I was out in California where it's legal. And so we said, let's go and look. Look. <laughs> and so we walked in, and this guy, he looked like uh, you, you, the two guys, Cheech and Chong. <laughs> I swear to you, I swear to you, he was, he was working there. He said, you want a joint, man? I said, oh, God. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> oh, okay. I, no, I don't think it's going to hurt. No, no, no. Yes, sir. Uh, Chief, um, being here today, um, I see many hopeful signs for the whole metro Detroit area. Um, if you just think about the Jesuit influence within this room, a few of the faces anyway I know uh, personally, um, and then you think about there are three Catholic high schools in the city of Detroit yet that are very Jesuit related. Crystal Ray, this wonderful Loyola High School back here. Uh, U of D Jesuit High School from which your son graduated and I had the pleasure of being there myself for 26 years along with a number of other people here in this room. There are hopeful signs. University of Detroit Mercy. 
um, Jesu Parish, Saints Peter and Paul downtown. And I bet there are people from every one of these institutions right here in this room. Many hopeful signs. Another hopeful sign, and I'm, I'm getting around to this, where I'd like <laughs> you to comment. This wonderful former basketball player over here, Dan Kennedy, and I belong to St. Mary of the Hills and Rochester Hills, along with my wife, Jill. And maybe there are some others, I don't know. One of the things that we're doing is we are, have established conversation, getting together yeah. with Christ the King, for example, in Detroit, St. Suzanne's, Our Lady Queen of Heaven, Gate of Heaven. And a number of those folks, besides being Catholic, are African American. And so just the idea of them coming to our parish, recently about 70 of them, and uh, there's Moses that we are very active with, but also we go to their parishes just to talk yeah. and to share, getting to know each other, listening, understanding each other better. I see those as signs of hope. There is one heck of a lot of racism and anger and violence within our metro area. But we have so many of these hopeful signs. And I just wondered if you could comment from your years of experience and wisdom, how can we enlarge these? How can we even do more? Well, Thank let's you. say this, you're doing it right now, but I think too that there are people that's coming back to the city to build, to live, that we never assumed so. I can remember when we had a million, almost 900,000 people in the city, and right now we're about 600 or so thousand. But the people, and I'm, I'm gonna help Mike Duggan here, not help him, but, but you, when Mike became mayor, I mean, there's a whole different uh, at, attitude that came about and started changing things. And look at the number of things and people that's coming or moving into the city uh, and the businesses, that's most important. The businesses that's, that's moving to the city. If we continue to do that, I think that, other than the educational aspect of it, that's what we continue to need. We need the better schools also. Thank you, that's it everybody.